it's a pretty um, casual intro. Uh, Chari uh, is Sri Lankan, uh, but he has spent the best, better part of his life uh, abroad. And he's at, a professor at the University of Western Australia. The fun fact is that he was my PhD supervisor and we have a long-standing relationship. So um, it's always nice to work with people that you have long-standing relationships. And um, it's, it's been really good for us to be working on this particular project together because it means a lot to both of us and we it, it's also been an opportunity and a privilege to be able to get the science out to people because people have been quite upset by the beach nourishment project and it has been an opportunity to make sure people know really why they should react the way they do and have some facts behind that so just some fun facts. Chari was also the head prefect at Royal College and a Sri Lankan swimmer. Uh, held a record for a hell of a long time. Um, and that was broken after many, many years. No, Chari? 18. 18 years. Okay, so that's a pretty solid record. But just to give you a background, Chari's research encompasses coastal ocean physical processes and their influence on climatic, biological, and geological processes in estuaries, the near shore, beach zone, and the continental shelf region. Uh, he uses field measurements, remote sensing, and computer modeling as the tools for research. He supervised 60 postgraduate research students. As I said, I'm one of them, and 20 postdoctoral researchers, and published over 450 articles, which include 175 in peer-reviewed international journals. The man does know his stuff, which is why we have him here today to give you guys a really great walk through about the whole all the concepts behind what's going on on our beach in Mount Lavinia and to give you a real sense of the science but in a really interesting way so I hope you enjoy this um, and you know participate at the end we'll open up for questions for now if I can ask you all to put your videos off and your mics are on mute so that Chari can take the floor and he will show us slides and make this very interesting and at the end please do feel free to ask questions because he's the expert and I'd love for you to be able to interact with him directly. All right, thank you. Thanks, Chari. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so we'll talk about beach nourishment, but we'll talk about beaches in, in context. Um, but before we sort of go, um, Asha said that I have spent a lot of my time, uh, definitely my professional life out of Sri Lanka. But on the other hand, I have done a lot of work in Sri Lanka too. So if we look at, Sri Lanka, a map. If you look at, if you've been to fishing boat harbors in Kudavalla and Panadura. So Kudavalla, I designed that harbor in a, uh, what we call a stable beach situation. Panadura, we, um, I designed it for it to remain open, but those was then rehabilitated after the tsunami. In Chilau, we did a lot of work to try to be able to um, look at how to keep the, the, Dadru, uh, the Chilau mouth open and how it interacted with the Dadru Oya. And this is a photograph. It's probably, we did so much measurements in the surf zone here. It's probably the, that was 20 years ago. It's probably the only surf zone measurements of cross shore currents and sediment transport that has been undertaken in Sri Lanka. Um, some of you probably heard of NIFNI, the Ocean um, University. Um, I basically wrote their first curriculum uh, when they started off uh, and probably doesn't uh, show it at the moment. Might have changed quite a lot. Um, tsunami. Um, this particular hut here I don't know whether they still existed, but that was in 2004. And um, when I was in Sri Lanka, I was telling them, this was in the uh, 2002, 2003, that Sri Lanka was one of the most wonderful places on earth in terms of the ocean, because it doesn't suffer from 
global sea level rise. And they would what do you say, how can that be? And I said, well, you don't measure it. If you don't have a tide gauge, how do you know your sea level is rising or not around Sri Lanka? Um, but nothing came out of it. And then sometime later, I managed to contact some colleagues in the US and persuaded them that Colombo needed a tide gauge. And they agreed and they established this uh, together with NARA and, and it's still working. And that's the uh, interesting part of that was in August 2004, it was established. And then in December, we had the tsunami. And from a science point of view, it's one of the few uh, measuring stations in the whole of the Indian Ocean, which measured the tsunami. So during the tsunami, you, this is Pagala railway station. You can see the missing of um, the roofs. There's an interesting story here as well. Pagala is my mother's uh, hometown. And this railway station was built by my grandfather, uh, sorry, her grandfather, so my great grandfather. But the water seven meters went over. And before that happened, I was actually standing here on the beach. So here you can actually see the, this is the, uh, railway crossing and the road. So this is where I was about 20 minutes before this satellite image was taken. So where I was standing, there was seven meters of water after uh, I went away, luckily. But then I was part of the team, which was basically developing a tsunami warning system for uh, the Indian Ocean. Um, and my responsibility was to develop the modeling component to, to predict where the tsunamis will arrive, etc. And so that's part of one of the things that I have done. Um, and then uh, with NARA, we did a, um, a, a project to identify areas uh, with higher aggregations of tuna so that fishing boats can actually go and target those areas. So that warning, not warning, the um, information is issued every Monday to fishermen still, and, and they basically go out and do that. And then also the EIA for Norachalai power station was done by us. Okay, so now we are going to look at what happens in the beach. This is a paper that we published maybe three or four years ago. And the interesting thing that I wanted to highlight in this, this is what we call wicked problem. A, a coast, people are very emotive. People have their own opinions because people go to the beach for recreation, for their work, their business, their livelihood, everything. So you have a range of land uses, stakeholders, investments that both could be internal and external to the coastal zone. And this means that you have physical, ecological, and socioeconomic interactions. And this is what we call a wicked problem. These are complex, challenging, have multiple feedbacks, and are highly uncertain and also have ambiguous solutions. So because of this very emotional, emotive system that we all want to have a part of, there's a lot of competition in terms of what will happen to that beach and how it is being used. So we talk about coastal adaptation. So here, let's say we have a beach. This is today, or uh, we have a reference line if you look at, and so you can see my background. This is from Mirissa. You can see a very nice beach and everything is pretty nice. So if we have erosion or let's say sea level is rising, you might have an adoptive response. So you might end up having houses on stilts. You can have protection such as here, a seawall, etc. You can have beach nourishment, as we've shown here, 
or we say it's too expensive, we're not going to do any protection, we are going to retreat from the beach. So here, this is actually a photograph from Perth, that there is what we call a setback. So there's a, almost a kilometer here from between the, the ocean and the, one of the most expensive suburbs in Perth, so that there is a very big buffer that allows, if the sea comes in, no infrastructure has to be done. So one of the things that we uh, uh, are promoting to a certain extent is this, if we can, to retreat. Because the cost of protecting or beach nourishment or intervention sometimes is far too expensive than the value of the infrastructure that we are trying to save. So a few things about coastal erosion and, and really most of the time, there is no erosion problems on beaches until people build on them. And something which may have happened 100 years ago can still have an effect now. And some cases, it might be quite far away from where the building actually occurred and the consequences may happen a few years later. But anything that we build along the coast increases erosion rates due to the flexibility, the lack of flexibility of a controlled beach. Because every beach, every day, is in equilibrium with the waves and the currents which impact on it. If you build something, you're taking that flexibility for the beach to respond to those changes. And once we start a protection, we can't stop it. We have to keep going. And often we have to put more and more money and more strengthening and maintaining those protections. To save the beach, we must destroy it, unfortunately. The cost to save property is often greater than the value of the property. So if you see on the bottom uh, picture here, these people have very nice houses, very nice system, but again, if you're spending millions of dollars for, uh, to protecting those houses and the combined cost of those houses are less than that, then that is a consideration that we have to take. So often, why do we need coastal protection? And this is because existing infrastructure is located too close to the allow for natural variability. In many countries, including Australia and the law in Sri Lanka, there you cannot build very close to the coast. But in a lot of cases, the problems that we uh, have now is the problems that have hap uh, the, where people have built 30 to 40 years ago, and now the problems are coming. We have, as I said, construction of new structures, uh, creates erosion, existing long-term erosion, and then of course climate change will increase this. So I have been saying in Australia for the last 20 years, when you got a big storm, then everybody comes and asks, oh, what's going to happen? And a rule of thumb is that if you have a problem now, it's just going to get much worse as we come with climate change in the next 20 to 30 years. And when do we need coastal protection? We need to consider the cost versus benefit. And this benefit is not only in terms of the value, but we also have to think of what are the natural assets of that area. Protection is often seen as the easy option, but more expensive option than compared to the coastal retreat. And no country in the world has sufficient money to protect their whole coastline. So somewhere, everybody in the next, globally, has to think about retreat. New structures come with long-term maintenance requirement and may cause follow-on problems. On the other hand, advanced planning will reduce the cost and liability. Now we're gonna look at a little bit 
of theory to a certain extent. How does sand move on the beach? It won't um, be, um, you have um, waves basically suspend the sand, right? And then any currents, so either the cross shore currents or in the long shore currents will transport the sediment in that direction. So when we look at the system, so we have a beach, we have a wave, and they're coming at some angle. The amount of sand which is being transported, which we say the transport rate is Q, is proportional to the wave height to the power of three, to the grain size, also to the power of three, and the angle of incidence proportional to twice the angle where it is being incident. Now here's the big problem when we're talking about sand transport on beaches or in coastal zone, we can't do it well. So our accuracy is about a factor 10 outside the surf zone and maybe a factor two inside the surf zone. And this is the big problem. So we can use lots and lots of different areas, uh, methods, but we will not get the same answer. A few years ago in Canada, they did, they looked at a beach and they looked at all, you know, maybe 10 or 15 different methods to calculate the longshore transport rate. And they, their estimates range from about 10 cubic meters per year to 150 cubic meters per 150,000 cubic meters per year. And that is the range. And that is one of the problems that we cannot actually get a handle on how much sediment is moving on the beach in terms of a value. So we also think about the, the there's also natural variability due to the changing seasonal wind conditions and wave conditions. So during storms, let's say in winter, the sand is, gets transported offshore, we have narrow beaches, we have a bar forming offshore. During swell dominated periods, there is onshore transport and there is wide beaches. And there is longshore transport due to prevailing wave direction. So this is a beach in, in Australia, just in Perth, this is called Trig Beach. And you can see here in summer, you have a nice wide beach. And in winter, you have a narrow beach. And, and this depends in terms of the storms and uh, summer, depends on what we call the wave steepness. And particularly in this parameter here, which is the wave height over the uh, wave period and the fall velocity. So what happens in winter is that the sand is taken off the beach and deposited offshore in a sandbar. And in summer, so this is in our case, for Sri Lanka case, this is the monsoon. And in the non-monsoon period, that sand gets moved and you get a wider system. So this is um, a Margaret River. You can see a winter situation. And if you look at in, win in summer, that is the beach. And that happens every year. You have this change in the beach profile. So when we have a high wave energy, sand gets eroded, moves offshore. When you have lower wave, wave steepness, the sand moves onshore. And then the storms disrupt this equilibrium position, but they will keep coming back again. So to give you an example, so this is a, a, a Northern Hemisphere summer in April. So you have spring and then the wave heights get smaller. So the beach will start growing. And then you actually have the waves will get bigger, the periods get smaller, and then the beach will erode. So that's the natural phase of the beach moving back and forth during summer and winter, in your case, monsoon and non-monsoon due to the changes in the beach steepness because of the changes in the wave climate. 
Now I'm going to sort of give you an analogy. I'm going to think that you have a small business. And in this business, you have an income, you have an expenditure. The difference gives us a profit or a loss. And the income and expenditure is controlled by your cash flow. Okay. So let's say that your small business is a function of season. Let's say you have an ice cream van. So in summer, you spend, a lot, so you spend a lot of ice cream. So your income is higher than expenditure. And in winter, you don't sell as much um, ice cream, but maybe your expenditure is higher because you have to do repairs to your van and things like that. But altogether, through the year, the income will, let's say, exceed your expenditure and you still make a profit. But then you have a system where you had a poor season. A lot of rain, bad summer, you didn't actually have a, as much um, ice creams that you sold. But in winter, you had some storm damage, a tree fell on the roof of your van, you have a lot of expenditure, and now certainly you have that year have made a loss because your expenditure was higher than your system. So that's how you do with your sm uh, small business, right? It's no different to your bank account. Well, a beach is no different either. If I take the dollar sign and say sand, the amount of sand which comes into the beach and the amount of sand which goes out of the beach gives you a surplus of sand and the beach will accrete. If more sand goes out of the beach than what is coming in, you will have erosion and the beach will erode. You have a deficit. So that's really in terms of what we call a, a sand budget. So this is the same when we talk about for a beach, we might have a summer and a winter, we have different wave climates. So we have, uh, maybe you have a poor season on the sand. When you've got the next year, you might have the beach may be more vulnerable and over years you might actually still may have a system that is balanced over longer period. You might have a system where you have a lot more storms, you have a lot more erosion, but if you haven't changed the budget and your sand flow, you may still keep your system in neutral. So when we look at the sand budget, we think about what is coming into the beach. I'll show this you know, in a graphically in a minute. So we have longshore transport into the beach, we might have river supply, we might have coast cliff erosion, onshore transport, which comes to the beach, and you lose sand out of that beach from transport uh, in the longshore direction, offshore, maybe you have dunes and the wind transport sand into the beach. The difference between those gives us the balance, whether we have accretion, erosion, or a steady state. So let's think of a, a piece of a beach that we're looking at. We, here we have longshore transport coming in, longshore transport going out. In this particular case, there is more, land, uh, there's 50,000 coming in here and 55,000 going out. And here we have an offshore transport of 15,000 and maybe you have all of these different other components. In this particular case, we have a deficit of 10,000 cubic meters per year, which means that we would have a net erosion. So if we wanted to actually make this beach neutral and not accreting, we have to find 10,000 cubic meters per year. So if you take the same example for the stretch of coast that we're going to looking at, so this is Mount Lavinia Hotel, um, this is a Ponce Avenue here. Think of 
how much transport is coming into this box, how much is going out, and how much is also going out into the offshore direction. We don't have any rivers or cliffs or any other components in here, so the only three components that we have. So coastal erosion then happens because of the changes to the sediment budget. And this could be for many reasons. Might have the land subsiding or the sea level is rising. You might have reduction in fluvial supply. So in Sri Lanka, there is a lot of sand mining going on and that is going to reduce the amount of sand coming into the beaches. Erosional supply that previously may have been supplying in system. Sometimes, we stabilize the dunes so that the dunes don't erode, but then you're taking the sand out of the system. Can have changes in your offshore, onshore transport. Then from the beach itself, people might be taking sand out. Can increase the wave energy through the alteration of offshore bathymetry and might have changes in the incident wave angle and also if the groundwater level on the beach is rising then you would also have additional system so now i'm going to sort of give you a, a hypothetical system to look at and apply this principle okay so now we're going to look at places maybe you are familiar with we have Gaul here and we have Valigama Bay here. They are separated. So these two bays are very nice boundaries to say what we call a sediment cell. Because there is no, at the two edges, there is no noticeable amount of sand which is moving from into that system. So whatever sand which is currently in these beaches is finite. They're basically being moved back and forth by the changing monsoon seasons. Now let's look at in the middle here. So this is um, this is Kogula Lake. The entrance, the lake entrance is here, or the lagoon entrance is here. We're going to look at this area here, which is Kogula Beach. And in here, so this is Long Beach. And uh, you can see the, the headland in here, the changes in the coastline. It's a nice beach here, so, but it's very hard to get that sand onto here. All the way around here, there's lots of reefs and the waves are, break, are breaking. So these reefs are protecting these properties here. But now here we have an area which are a direct impact onto the beach. And this has been stable for many decades, but over the last couple of years, you're finding that some of these um, hotel accommodations are threatened by the coastal erosion. Okay. So now let's look at this concept of the sediment budget. As I had said that we actually have a, a system which is close. We have a very um, definite boundaries at the two ends. So now we can look at, if look at Google Earth in here, this part here, here uh, inside resort, they have built a groin. So now we are accumulating sand upstream side of that. There's a natural beach here. And then we have accumulation here, and this is the Kogula Beach here. Okay. So when we go back and have a look at what might have happened, so Kogula Beach is not a nice white beach, a sand accumulation here, and there is not very much construction in other parts of that coast. So this is in 2005 after the tsunami, and we keep looking at 2009 monsoon period so there is no sand on the beaches for this reason that i said that the natural variability 
Now we go to 15th of March. We again see white beaches. This is 2011. There is not, there is slight construction here. And then we have accumulation of sand. And then you have um, 2012, again, sandy beaches. But then you actually start in 2014. They're now built additional systems. Now you can see the sand, which most likely was coming across, is now going inside to the harbor. So this is now creating a, a sink. And we've now changed the budget. So there is not sufficient supply coming here. So this beach is eroding. Okay. So here. You see. So 2019, you can see it's the system is quite full. And then this year, you can see that it is, uh, this is when it has been eroding, but it is trapping. But what I'm trying to say is that when we think and alter the sand budget, it's not in that local area, which you might have a problem but somewhere downstream. So you are, by interrupting the sand flow, you actually are creating a system where you are preventing somebody else. OK, so let's now go to artificial sand nourishment. So I told you right at the beginning, you can, you know, you can adapt, you can protect, you can add nourishment, or you can retreat. So this is one of the options that we have in terms of trying to control, in the essence, how to redress our sand budget. So the placement of large quantities of sand and gravel on the beach, it's very costly. In the US, it costs about 10 million per kilometer. Miami, they put 13 million cubic meters of sand, and that costs $60 million. In Gold Coast, they put eight, uh, 5 million cubic meters of sand, and 87 87% of the sand was retained on the beach two years later. At the moment, Gold Coast spends $10 million per year on nourishment of their beaches. But they get an income of $100 million from tourism. People go to the Gold Coast because of their beaches. If there are no beaches, there is no tourism. So they invest a lot of money in terms of to get the tourists. You probably have seen many photographs of beaches in Hawaii. Hawaii is a volcanic island and most of the sand is black volcanic. But you don't see black sand, you say nice quartz sand and all of that sand is imported from Australia and put on their beaches. It's worthwhile for them to do it because that's what they get their income from. So in terms of artificial nourishment, the major influence is the grain size. We normally use slightly coarser material so that they actually got in the system. But, you know, remember I said right at the beginning, we, are so emotive and so have a strong connections. I was talking to one of the engineers who did a, a very small sand nourishment project. And he said, I was criticized because the sand that he put was a different color, didn't match the existing beach. So these are the emotions that come out. So then artificial nourishment is not a new thing. So here you see in the Gold Coast, this was in, uh, two, um, 1936, you can see the beach was eroding, and this is what it looks like now in 2004. And this is from nourishment 
by pumping sand. So now hear what they see, what they do, not on the beach, but somewhere offshore. This is Miami. I told you that, so here, that was the beach before they did the nourishment. So 13 million cubic meters of sand was put on the beach. But another thing they had was they had structures on the beach that would keep that sea, uh, the sand on the beach to prevent it being washed away. So now we want to know when we are doing sand nourishment, where would you put it? So often they just put it on the top of the dune, above the, the, the water line, so that it is protecting only if the water level goes up and we have a storm. So that's one way. The second one is that not on the dune, but on the top of the beach and maybe a, a little bit under the water level. Next one is the combination of those two. So you do it all the way across the beach. And in here, we don't put it on the beach, but we put it offshore. So this is what Queensland does in Gold Coast. So it's not on the beach, they put it outside. And remember what I said about the onshore offshore transport in the different seasons that will bring the sand onshore and offshore. And then the third one is the most expensive of all that you put sand across all of the system. So in the case of Mount Lavenia, they did this. So they pumped the sand onto the beach and used earth moving equipment to flatten it and push it offshore. So that's how you place it. Then you want to find out what volume did you want. So to estimate the volume, we take, as I said, some studies to undertake a sediment budget to understand what are the sources and sinks and long-term and seasonal trends. And we do that by looking at computer models, reviewing historic erosion rates and surveys, photos, etc. And the big lesson that everybody has learned is that the erosion will be far quicker of the beach, of the sand that we put in from expected from historic estimates. Remember that we are actually trying to fix the budget. So if you, in here, we are artificially replenishing sand. So if you don't change the system that gives you the deficit of your sand, the beach will still erode. So you have to do repeated nourishments. And usually the case is that you would, if you, let's say, you are, your deficit is X amount of cubic meters, you put five times that per year, so that you hope that the beach will be nourished for five years before you have to do it again. So now we will come to looking at Mount Lavenia. I'm gonna show you, go back a little bit in time and look at some old pictures of the Mount Lavinia beach. So in 1900s, a little bit early, I think this is 1880s. This is also 1880s. 1875, you can see the beach before it was constructed. This was, this picture actually is hanging behind me in the wall of my office. I organized a conference 10 years ago, and the hotel presented me as a gift of thanks for this one. But it also shows in 1875, these two are almost identical in effect. It's 1960. So one of the things that we have to sort of think is that we have a headland, which is rock, and we have lots and lots of rocks here as well. 
And then there is protection that has been for the railroad. So let's look at what happened in recent times. So there was sand nourishment for Mount Lavinia. The project done by CCD. So what they did was they extracted sand about two to six kilometers offshore. And I think they basically had a pipe which was going all the way across, which was putting the sand onto the beach. So they put 150,000 cubic meters sand on this beach over a distance of half a kilometer. And the idea of that is that that sand with time will end up in Valawa. And it would create a 15, 15 meter wide beach in Valawatha, which we decide, they decide as a sand engine concept. So if we look at the Mount Lovenia Hotel in here, so it's made on a headline, sorry, on a headland. We have, uh, you can see the direction where the waves are coming from. The sand is moving from south to north. So because of that headland, there's an accumulation of sand in the upstream direction. Then the waves diffract and then they move all the way across. And there is, when we come out here, we do see this uh, rock here at the end of Oponso Avenue, which is also accumulating sand in the system. So, when we take a close up of the hotel, so this is what we call saturated. So the sand can actually move from around the headland and to the bay here. And we call this a headland bay, stable. So what that means is that you can see how I have uh, drawn a white line. The waves diffracting arrives at the beach perpendicular. So that is reducing the alongshore transport and the beach has adjusted to it. If you're interested, I forgot to put it in. Have a look all the way down the coast, all the way from Gaul to Bentota, the coast is all like this. This is the feature of the Sri Lankan coast. There's a lot of rocky headlands and you have this shape of the headland bay all the way through the next headland, etc. All the way through, you will see that. So the idea was that they would put this 150 cubic meters of sand in Mount Lavinia, and then the sand on, on this region here. And the idea was that this sand will move all the way to Valawatha, five kilometers away. Now the sand engine concept is done in the Netherlands. This is a picture of that. And there they put 21 million cubic meters of sand. You can see the sand here. And that amount of sand was to supply the coastline for the next 20 years. So it's a very different concept to what we are talking about today in Mount Lavinia. Very low amount of input. So, then we have satellite images. We can actually look at how stable this beach has been, or this stretch of the beach, for the, since 2016 to 2019. And this analysis was done by Dr. Pushpa Disanayake at uh, Keele University. So when we look at, this is from the Sentinel satellite, and you can see there aren't that much changes in the beach over the last three years or so. Remember, this is also in top of up to 20 to 30 meters or more seasonal variability that we see because of the monsoon and the non-monsoon system. Then, as I said, we have the coastal obstruction. So we have the rock here that is accumulating sand to the upstream of it. Then we have the outlets from the, the Hibola Canal, 
which they have built structures to keep it open. So trapping the sand in the upstream, erosion downstream, trapping upstream, erosion downstream. And then all of that, we also have offshore reef systems where the waves are breaking that is protecting the coastal beach to a certain extent from the high waves that we would experience. Now, unfortunately, anything that we do with the ocean and really, in a way, our daily life depends on timing. So imagine that you're driving and you met with an accident. Most of the time, you will blow your horn and you will not have the accident. But why does an accident happen? Because many things happened at the same time. Maybe someone was not, uh, two people were not making um, attention to the road. Somebody was on their phone or something like that. They all come together to happen. The thing. So in extreme events, we say that it is a result of many things which happen together. And unfortunately, in this particular case, the same thing happened. So soon after the nourishment, we had tropical cyclone Amphan, which was, didn't actually hit Sri Lanka, but it increased the winds and it increased the waves. So that had a adverse effect, but don't forget that the monsoon is yet to come, and that's going to happen over a few months as opposed to a few days. So what we did was we ran a model. Uh, Dr. Vijay Ratna did this for us. And then we can see this is the wave height on, due on, on that day, uh, during the Amphan. So on the coastal areas, you can see very low waves in here after the waves breaking or due to the reefs. And then we looked at what happens to the sand. So this is showing us the bed level that we simulated with our computer. Blue is erosion, red is accretion. This is Mount Lavinia here. And what it shows us when I zoomed in is that this is Mount Lavinia here, that that sand has been moved and then has taken offshore and is deposited on the reefs out here. Okay. So it is unlike what if they actually go outside the reef system, then of course they can't come back in. It's lost to the system. Uh, then a lot of people ask me, well, what about Port City? Does Port City has an influence in this? So let's look at Port City. On the left is Colombo Harbor, before Port City. This is what they did with the Colombo South Breakwater to make the harbor much bigger. That's a ex, um, zoomed in version. And they built Port City in the shadow of this. So irrespective of Port City was there or not, the Southern Breakwater Project is the one which has the biggest influence on here and not Port City. So a lot of people say, oh, Port City is going to have, but the Port City of there not, what changes has happened due to the Southern Breakwater, which is a much bigger system than what we have here. And then one of the things that also happened was the coastal garbage. I, I, I saw today on the, uh, on the news somebody saying that this is the way of the ocean paying us back because us, mankind, stole the sand from the ocean, but the ocean took back the sand and gave us the rubbish. So it is basically penalizing. Interesting analogy. But let's look at it more scientifically. We had this garbage coming up, and then this is the, the tight gauges record from that tight gauge I said I helped to establish. And interestingly, Cyclone Amphan happened when the tides were very low. 
If it happened two weeks later, it would be quite high. So then that we have high tides during the full moon. So this is the Wesak full moon, and this is the Pusun well. This is last weekend. So during the week of the Pusun weekend, we had very high tides, which means that the water could actually go very high up on the beach. If you had a natural beach, which is what this might have been looked like before, the waves would be going back and forth along the slope. But now we change the beach slope because we actually put a nourishment here. We put an artificial system which is not in equilibrium with the incoming waves. We added this. So now when we had the high tides, the water can actually go over here. A lot of that water will percolate through the sand and little of the water will come back in. But of course, all the rubbish and the garbage would be left on the beach. And another interesting component is that uh, Asha went and looked at the areas where the garbage was. And most of the garbage was between these two lines. And if you look at the coastline, you have a little changes in the coastline orientation in that area. So what can happen also is that the waves can actually deflect and refract and concentrate in that region there. And another very crazy idea, which I hope that doesn't happen, is to fill all the reefs between Dehiwala and Kolpidi and to create a beach park. And I hope that that really, that's very expensive. I don't think it happens. So to finish off, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Vijay Ratna and Dr. Disanaika, Asha and Nadia for all their help. And I put this picture from Gorefres Green, 18, 1880s. See, that seawall was built then. It's still there. There probably has raised it a little bit, I bet, but that part is still there. Thank you. Hi, okay, thanks very much, Chari. Um, until you stop sharing your screen, I don't think people can see me. Okay, people can see me now. Great. It's not just a phantom voice. Okay, that was really great. Thank you so much, Chari. I think one of the key things you realize is that data is everywhere. And I, I hope everybody realized that a lot of what Chari was showing you obviously has the science that he uses to analyze it. But, you know, Google Maps. Google Maps is available to all of us. And uh, if you know how to use it, there's a lot of stories we can tell. There's a lot of data we can collect. There's a lot of um, things we can learn actually about our sort of coastlines and stuff like that. So I think that's really fascinating. And um, it was a great talk to me. I love listening to these things. It's, it's nice and lucid. And I think um, uh, there's room for questions. So I would love if anybody has questions, you can type it into the chat box. Uh, you are free to also ask it. But if you want to put it in the chat box, I'm more than happy to just repeat it. Um, I will kickstart so you know to warm the room up. Hi Vijay. So Vijay is also online and Vijay is um, one of the collaborators for the longer term look at this and he did some of the modeling that um, you were looking at today. So we have so, and also the other cool thing is that there's a team of basically Sri Lankan scientists who are all over the world come together to do this. Uh, there's a lot of power in that and it just goes to show what kind of capacity we do have. Um, and um, it's nice to see that we can bring that sort of uh, intellectual power together to do something positive. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to keep that the question. Uh, can, I, can I also say, if you put your mouse on the participants, yeah. a menu will come and you would actually have a raised hand. Uh, you can raise okay. your hand. So please. put your, uh, but if you do that, you've got to switch your video on and then we can see that you want to ask a question. Okay, is everyone clear? You can do that. You can tap in the type in the chat box. You're free to do whatever you want, but we'd love to have some questions. I'm sure some of you are sort of like have thoughts about what you've seen, what you've heard. So I want a quick kickstart, which is a question that I've been asked. Um, and, you know, so the project, Chari, was designed 
to deposit sand in Vallavatta, right? But they were, obviously, they nourished the beach in Mount, and there was a hope that the sand would then be transported. Now, we know that now this headland is in the way, um, and it didn't make sense to do that. But why do you think they didn't just nourish Vallavatta beach itself? They didn't have, well, it's much more expensive, and they have to have extra five kilometers of pipe. Okay, so... Um, so it's much more, because remember that they have only had permission to take the sand from Ratmalana. Hmm. So to move it five kilometers more would have been more expensive. Okay. That's my logical answer. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, the, uh, is the... Like, I don't know, is it very, very much co more costly to add that five kilometers of pipe? I mean, I don't know, which is why I'm sort of asking. I don't know either. Mm. But to maintain five kilometers of pipe is also very hard. Mm. That's a good point as well. Yeah, it's the maintenance, I suppose. Okay, great. Um, anybody want to ask questions? There's a lot of cool people in the room who I know have lots of thoughts about these things. So please, uh, this is your chance while Char is sipping his Coca-Cola. Um, and so, okay, so my next question as we're waiting for people to warm up is, um, what do you think, uh, how do we monitor this? Okay, so now we're gonna start a project with some students and we just talked about this beforehand to do some measurements of the beach width, right? To look at natural, like the variability over the year. So we'll be doing that. But how about the, the reefs? Um, and the sort of the reefs out there is there is there a need for us to monitor that throughout the year just to look at sand deposition or what kind of suggestions can you give us yeah I mean if there are people who are have the ability to do I mean what you normally will do is you would go and mark out an area in a beach on, on, a, on the reef right of, of a quadrant and and then you will visit it many times and, and takes photographs and, and see how that's, you know, that reef has been, have you got sand there, does the sand go away? Or if there is no sand there, does there sand coming in? Okay, and that's good to know. Um, and then what can we expect in terms of, okay, so, so when you do a nourishment like this, right? So we put 150,000 cubic meters, right, of sand. Um, and we want to nourish the beach. Is that sufficient, the amount of sand that we dumped to actually get to Vallavatta? And I mean, in the hypothetical... Well, say, I can't say because, I mean, I don't know what actually, what was the justification for use 150,000? Hmm. Or why wasn't it 100,000? And why was it half a million? Right, right. So I, you know, that that sort of information is unavailable to say, you know, how did they actually look at it? Mm. But, you know, people in, in that area, at least on the West Coast, the uh, quoted and published papers say that there is of the order of uh, 200 to 250,000 cubic meters Big is chance. what the annual transport is. Okay. So that means that the they put in, let's say, 60% of the annual transport. But I don't know what the justification is, because we don't know. Mm. There's no numbers. And also, and I'm going to get to the question that's just come through, but um, also, like when you talk about the Dutch uh, project, where they did the um, uh, sort of the, the project with 21 million cubic meters, uh, it's long term, right? So they you put the sand, and it, it's a process that you're expecting to happen over a long period of time, um, and you design it so that it's going and depositing in the right place, but it doesn't happen overnight, right? But here we're just seeing it getting pushed offshore, which is the problem. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so I, we've got a question from Prav B, and it says the modeling of the sand movement shows the sand piling on the reef. What are if it, its effects on the reef system and what would happen to the beach area if it wasn't nourished when the storm hit? Nothing. That storm was not big. 
Sri Lanka has suffered uh, so many storms before that. We are actually, in a way, in terms of storms, we have benefits from climate change. I don't know whether people know this. Mm -mm. So before about mid 1970s, Sri Lanka used to get hit by at least one cyclone per year. Okay. And then now we get hit by on average one in five years. Okay. Because the cyclone belt, because of global warming, has moved further north. So Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal is actually getting more severe cyclones and more cyclones, but they're forming further to the north of Sri Lanka. Hmm. So the answer to you is that nothing would have happened because that beach would have experienced much severe storms than what we've had. Because and it would have gone through the the um, several monsoons. And as I showed you, at least from, from the data that we can have a look, that beach has been unchanged. Mm -hmm. And then, and so part of the question is, you know, the sand is piling on the reef, but that's, that's where we're seeing it shift to right now. Um, but if there is potential for it to go offshore beyond the reefs as well, right? With the circulation. Yeah. yeah so, so remember what I was talking about before, about a, a sand budget. Mm -hmm. So that's the offshore transport and it's lost to the system. Right. So there's another question said, are there issues around the canal entrances? Uh, could be. If mm. that sand actually goes north, and as expected, would get to Alawatha, but they would basically clog up the estuaries, the canal est en entrances. So they would, if that happens, they obviously have to dredge to keep it open. Okay, so adding to the cost, right? So unintended costs, perhaps, that were unthought of. What? So that's another very interesting one. What is the alternative? I mm. said, don't do anything. Yeah. The alternative, that, you know, this was not a, as I said, in all of this, you know, what, what is the business case? If you talk about a business, what is the business case to doing this? What are you protecting? What are the benefits in terms of um, economy, right? Um, what, what infrastructure are you trying to save mm. or protect? None of that doesn't come into the equation as far as I can see. Yeah. So there's a question from uh, Nirushan Arul. Uh, can you discuss about Oluville Harbor failure due to sedimentation? Are you able to comment on that? It's a, it's, it's a private message that I've got, so I'm not going to read out the name in case it's meant to be private. Can you discuss about Oluville Harbor failure due to sedimentation? Now, I have no idea. Ah. Because Oluville, I'm actually going to start working on an area to the north of Batiko soon. Okay. Uh, Pasikuda. Is it Pasikuda? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere there. Anyway. Uh, I um that didn't have much to do with all the at all so i'm not very familiar with it okay uh there's another one here what effect did the south harbor breakwater have on the beach south of uh, i doubt it actually had very much to do with it because the waves are coming from the southwest so the colombo south harbor would have an effect the bigger effect is to the north so to the Kalani, the, you know, between basically Kalani and Nigambo is the area where it would have been affected. This is only in terms of the sand transport. You know, there could be um, other ones. Now, what happens also is that we talk about the southwest monsoon, which the waves are coming from the southwest. But during the non-monsoon, we have the sea breeze. Mm. So when you go for a nice beach walk in the evening, you will see the fresh sea air coming. And that has a angle which comes from the northwest. And that creates waves which go to the south. And then so you have some sand which will be moving from north to south during the non-monsoon periods. 
So okay. although the net transport is to the north, there is also a southward transport, a smaller amount during that period. Okay, so they, that's where you're seeing the balancing act coming in, right? Yeah. So there are processes that it's balance each other. That's but it doesn't balance. The what comes south is weaker. It's is 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 smaller than what goes north. So in the in a balance for the year, it actually goes north. Okay, and that's because the northeast monsoon winds are less. Do with the monsoon. Okay. The monsoon, the northeast monsoon doesn't have an effect, but the sea breeze does. Okay, okay. Okay, that happens in the non-southwest monsoon period. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any other mainly in January, Mainly in January, February. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Got it. Okay. Very cool. Okay, so it's 8.38. If anyone has some more questions, you know, we can take another, maybe a couple more questions. Um, I mean, this is fascinating. I really do hope that you've all sort of got an opportunity to really think more in depth about what is going on. And, you know, I think it's good to be upset about things and be vocal about wanting change and holding people accountable. But I also do believe very strongly in knowing what you're asking people to and why you're upset, which is sort of, again, why we put together this report. Again, why I want to try to come and talk to you all to give us all sort of that background also of the processes and the concepts, which I think can make us all better informed citizens. Um, we have, um, okay, so there's another question. Ooh, now questions are coming. People are really excited because I'm like about to shut down. This is what happens. Okay, is there any impact of taking sand from offshore deposits? Asked, asked Manuri Fernando. Well, uh, the interesting thing is that if you take the sand out, Remember, it's all of our systems are in equilibrium. So, the experience, I will tell you a little story in a minute. Our experience is that the sand that you take out will come back. Okay. So, the sand which, so they would make a sand pit, it will not be that deep. It will basically, they scrape the top, but after a year or two, it will come back. The question is that where does it come from? Mm. So if they do very much offshores, I mean, it's the same thing, right? It's the same budget. If you take something from somewhere, someone else is going to suffer. And, and it's the same. So that's in, in thing. So I, uh, we did a, some work in, in Brisbane. And they, in these tidal areas, which is what I did my PhD on, you have these very large sand banks. They're called tidal sand banks, about 20 meters high and maybe 30 to 40, sorry, um, about five to 10 kilometers long. They're massive deposits. So they took one of these whole sand banks out to build the Brisbane airport. Mm. Two years later, all of that sand had come back. So the whole sandbar with bank they'd actually took we would actually do that. Okay. Um, okay, there's a question from Sachit. There's two questions, so I'm going to give you both. They're on private, which is why I'm going to uh, read them out. What measures can we take for more eroding coastlines in Sri Lanka? Um, and with regards to protecting the eroding coastline with effects from climate change, such as sea level rise? I told you, we have to take a business case. No. See, it's in anywhere in the world, it's the same, right? It doesn't matter whether it's Sri Lanka, Australia, the US, England. Every private citizen expect the governments to go and spend money to protect their property mm. from sea level rise. The governments in the world does not have that much money to do that. So I have been asked many times to go in, in Western Australia. They said, oh, this beach is eroding. What can we do? And I said, well, what are you trying to do? Oh, there is a toilet block. So are you going to spend millions of dollars to save a toilet block? So in some cases, we have to take the decision as we go into the future, we can retreat. Uh, one second. Someone, uh, I don't know who TD is. But can you, would you mind? 
bring your yeah. video off. So, so the question, you know, before you do any intervention, you actually have to say, is it worth it? So in, in, in the US now, you know, the insurance companies actually say, we're not going to insure you. Hmm. And the government is saying, we're not going to do this. So if a flood comes, if your house falls into the sea, you're not going to get compensation. Okay. All right. So unfortunately, you know, obviously it doesn't matter again which country, all of these will come up to because of political decisions. Mm -hmm. So all we can do is to contribute to that political decision. Mm -hmm. So there is another question. I'm not really sure what it says. What are we expect for October till April 21, especially when diving? Are you mean for the next season? If you have, if you have a, uh, let's say, a very strong monsoon, that may not be different from last year to this year. Maybe, right? But certainly, April twenty, uh, sorry, October twenty-one for the next season, you shouldn't really have a problem. Great. Okay, well, I think we've gone through all your questions and really appreciate people asking. And I really hope you feel like you got some clarity on the issue. Uh, I do want to say thank you very much to Chari. Thanks, Chari, for coming in. It is two and a half years, two and a half hours later in Perth, uh, but uh, he still made the time to do this talk so that we could accommodate people after office hours so you could join in and ask. <laughs> something um so thank you very much everybody for coming thank you very much thank you also to everybody who's working on this right now uh from science side um you know again uh, to dr Bisanaika, dr vijay who is here um chari myself nadia i mean i think it is a collective effort and i think uh, it's really really fulfilling to do something that's uh, can help uh, the country so uh, we will continue working on this in many different ways. So stay tuned and do keep following us at Oceans where we have lots of different events that we host. We have lots of live sessions. We try to bring a lot of really great experts to the room so you can have a chance to interact. So please do come uh, join us. You can find out about all our events on our oceans. The website is oceanswell.org. On our events page, we have all these events coming through constantly. Uh, check us out on our social media at oceanswell.org stay uh, up to date we cater to all age groups we also do stuff for kids but also for the general public and adults and university students so we really want to make sure everyone is getting as much knowledge as possible so that we can all make better decisions about things around us related to the oceans so with that i want to say thank you very much chari and um yeah look forward to talking to you soon